Welcome to the Bronx Hip Hop Oral History Project. Today is Monday, May 6th, 2024. I'm Pastor Crespo Jr., the research librarian for the Bronx County Historical Society. Today, I am joined by Joseph Salgado, also known as A-Rock, a dancer, pioneering b-boy, and founder and president of Twice as Nice Rockers. Welcome. Thank you. Great to have you here, A-Rock. I appreciate you uh, coming all the way from Schenectady, you know, just to record this oral history. Thank you so much. Um, we like to start out all these oral histories by asking you to tell us a little bit about your family history and background. Where do your parents come from? So where do my family and my parents and my background come from? All right. I come from, um, I was born in Brooklyn, uh, Wyckoff Hospital, Bushwick. My mother and my father, they met in Coney Island. They're both Puerto Ricans, you know. Um, so the rest of my family, my grandmother's side, my father's side is um, from Coney Island. They're both, their parents are from Puerto Rico that migrated over here during the 60s and 50s. Um, they, my mother is, a, a sing, she was a single parent. My father was a child that didn't really grow up with his parents. You know, so he had it rough. So that's why I give him, you know, I try not to take too much away from him. You know, everybody has a life to live. That's right. what I can say. Um, they met, they fell in love. My mother was only maybe 13 years old. My father was about maybe 16, 17 years old. And, you know, one day they, you know, I guess youngly fell in love, made a kid. My mother never told my father that um, she was pregnant. So one day my father was, uh, you know, he's a little crime, he's, you know, he's young. Yeah, I robbed the car, a bunch of cops behind him. My mother told him, hey, you're pregnant. I'm pregnant, you know. And he, my father normally just wants to get away. But for that moment of time, my father pressed the brakes, started hugging and kissing and crying my mother while they were taking him away in handcuffs. Wow. You know, so that's that part of the story. My mother had nobody else after that because whatever, from all his backdrop, he ended up staying in jail for quite a bit. So my mother gave birth by herself at 14 years old. Wow. I was a breech baby, so I came out with my feet already dancing. <laughs> you know, my mother said that, um, you know, that we're gonna give a C-section because she was too small for me to come out. But she forced me out herself. And she took me out with, still with the umbilical cord all attached and she put me on her chest and. She fainted, she said. So that was that story. After that, my mother, um, you know, was living in Bushwick for a little bit. But then my grandmother wanted me from Coney Island because I guess, she, you know, she wanted to um, do for me what she never did for my father. So she started raising me for a little bit. So I lived in Coney Island. Beautiful thing, you know. And um, after that, all my life was... Coney Island and Bushwick, Coney Island and Bushwick, Coney Island and Bushwick. After that, my father finally came out. He came and he moved to the Bronx. Never came back to Brooklyn, never came back to none of us. So just been for a long time, whatever. Life goes on. Now, I was already about, let's say, five years old. And at five years old, I went, started school. So now I'm in school in Bushwick because you know, my mother's out there with her mother and stuff like that. And I ended up going to one of the schools over there in Bushwick, on Bushwick Avenue. Can't quite remember the name of the number of the school. But um, stood there for a minute. I remember there was times, my mother was still young, party animal, and there was times I used to have to get up and walk my brother and my little sister, but she ended up having kids after that, back to back, you know. But and I remember at five years old, I used to, you know, six years old, my brother's five years old, my sister's four years old. I used to walk them to school by myself, you know, from Stockholm which was about about six blocks, seven long blocks to the school. Wow. So, I, you know, I became responsible at an early age, defensive, very, you know, making sure, you know, like I was a protector of my family, you know, in a rough area. Seen a lot of things even at an early age. From there, you know, my mother moved me out of, the, out of there, out of Stockholm, and we moved towards um, Willoughby Street, in Bushwick, where that was the first time I ever got bit by a Dublin pincher yeah. on my back, you know. She was still young then, fell in love with another guy, you know. Guy tried to help her, his name was Hendry. He looked out, he protected 
this for a minute. She was not loving him, whatever, we move forward. Now we move towards Star Street between Knickerbocker and Wilson. Now there was when uh, the light lit up in my head. Still being responsible, still being very protective of my mother and my brothers and my sisters. I'll catch it for them in a minute, even at that early age, I didn't care. I would kick you in your shin, but you're not gonna sit down and disrespect my mother in front of me. I was always like that. So from there, because of that, I was, I raised myself literally never to be a follower and always to be a leader. And I teach this to my family, my kids, my grandkids, everybody. Never be a follower. Always lead. Unless you're gonna lead wrong, then let somebody else teach you, you know? But it's good to be a leader, you know? So after that, that's when the Bieber, you know, you know, even before that, truth, I was into acting already. I was into family performances. I was already at six, seven, every time we had house parties, family parties okay. and all that stuff. I wanted to dance. I wanted to entertain the family, do something. And I was really doing that, you know? And there was times me and my brother, we used to put on uniform and my cousin, her name was Providence, and we used to entertain her every time family, we used to make routines, you know? To make the, so I was already, it was already, already in my blood. My father was a dancer, my mother was a dancer. You know, so according to what a lot of people tells me too, that my uncle, my grandfather's from Puerto Rico and is um, Papo Luca, which is a famous, you know, pianist with their bands and all that stuff. They never paid attention to my father neither. I don't know what happened between my grandmother and my grandparents. I never met my grandfather. So I'm on the loophole. I don't know what to, what to believe anymore. But one thing I do believe is myself because nobody was ever there for me, you know? So like I said, at second grade, I went to PS 123 and it was a very, there was a, a, a principal. Her name was um, Mrs. Spatler. And she was like, you could say a Pulowski kind of woman, you know? And um, very strict, very, ooh, forget about it. But she loved me. You know, no matter how bad or good I was, she always, you know, for some reason she always gave me that. So I ended up being in a in a in a, in a dancing class, you know, mm -hmm. glee club. I was in the glee club dancing, but I also was a, a performer already. That at the age of second grade, I would do um, let's say meet the match, you know, like a little show, I'd be the batter, the pitcher, and the runner. But the whole thing is just me doing it, performing. I've done. Performances that I can't even remember my mother tells me about it, you know? So I was already performing because of that school. There was time, this school was so, you know, like the school of art, you can say, mm -hmm. at a public school. But there was times that when we used to have some performances, brother, let me tell you something. The, all the television stations used to come just to watch us perform because that was her, that was her geek. And her thing was that you know, the auditorium was that big for everybody. It was just so many people, so many cameras, because it was such an artistic, you know, at a place in the time when it was really bad. Really, really, really bad in, in, in Bushwick. You know, really bad. Coney Island was, to me, was no matter even, they say the Warriors and all that stuff, but, but that was a walk in the park for me. Bushwick, <laughs> Nickelbacher Park, I didn't even walk through the park at certain times, you know what I'm trying to say? You right. go across the street. That was no walk to do that part, I promise you, during those days. So it was a place where that was infested with gangs. Right. Talk to us about the gangs. Now the gang, the gang worlds in the in the 70s. The gang worlds in the 70s were very, um, they wasn't killing each other, like shooting the way they are now, stabbing each other. You know, there was another, it was always hands up, you know, so be ready to catch it. So I, that was part of you know my life too, fighting. No matter how much I wanted to be a performer, but that was part of my life. I had no choice, I had to go through it, you know? So when I was in the second grade, third grade, there was a gang in schools. So one day I went to the school when I first kind of started, and there was a, they called them the pretty boys. Okay, there were a bunch of kids, second grade. Then they had the ugly boys. And all the pretty boys used to have all the pretty girls. You know, following us, so that's why they call them. Everybody in there used to be all dressed nice. You know, parents care for them. The ugly boys were just straight up hood rats <laughs> with boogers out of their nose, pure in their hair, 
all looking dirty with holes and you know, who knows, ringworms or, or dead ones on their underwear. <laughs> right? Nasty. But um, these guys were tough. Very tough kids. When I went to the school, one day I met this guy. His name was um, um, Jose. He was the leader of the Pretty Boy Gang. I was going down the steps, and there was a, a bunch of guys there. I'm the new guy. They tested me. My father, when I did get to spend some time with him, he used to be, he used to live in on 42nd Street, right where the ball drops, that building, uh -huh. in that building. I admit it, my father was a pimp. At that time, he became a pimp, right? He had, he had prostitutes watching me at an early age, five, seven, seven years, eight years. Whenever I saw him, I saw him a couple of times here and there. And I remember one day that uh, I looked out the window, you know, it was five o'clock in the morning, I'm looking out the window, I see my father laying down in the bed, a big bed, had like about seven women laying down with him. But overlooking the window, I mean, looking him out the window, I can actually see the whole 42nd Street, you know, Times Square with all the all the movie theaters. So that was, that's how I knew where he was at, you know. Right. Because, you know, I remember that time too, my father um, one day took me to an, ele uh, you know, an elevator upstairs, right? In those days, the elevators, you have to have a gate. Right. And it wasn't the regular, it was a gate that you had to whatever. So I remember pinching my finger, but he took me upstairs. I was crying like my mom, you know, whatever. And he opened up the gate, ran me to a certain floor, eighth floor, whatever, in that building, maybe higher up, I don't know. But I see my father in the picture, and right next to him, I noticed Bruce Lee. So in that same building, Bruce Lee had a, what you call it, a, a class, you know, where he has his class, a studio. And um, and I see my father in the picture with him. Like, you know, at an early age, I already knew who Bruce Lee was. And uh, he's a friend of mine, blah, 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 you know. So after that, now I'm thinking I'm karate. You know, I got him to come. You know, my father used to play with me, train me, kick me, you know. So he used to take me up, to, up there to hang out with him to, to, you know, to practice. So then during that time, that's when my father started calling me karate boom boom. Mm -hmm. Right? So... Not to reflect all that karate boom boom stuff and my father. So now I'll go back, you know, go back to this um gang stuff. So now this kid Jose and um, you know, they wanted to jump me and I picked up my hands, little kid, and this and they started laughing because of the way I was standing. And they said and then they said, well, who do you think you are? I said, Well, I told them you better not mess with me because I'm karate boom boom. <laughs> and then I beat the shit out of their asses. All right. So then I beat them down, and then I became the leader, automatically. So I didn't want to be the leader, but there was nobody who was whipping it, you know. Because like I said, even at an early age, I was always fighting, no matter where, cousin, this, friend. I, I was always stretching out. I don't know what it was. I guess that's what God made me. But I put up a good one, and I, I took over the gang. And um, and it was tough, tough kids. And now I have to fight these Cristobal and Dirty Gang. That was the name of their leader. The name of their leader was called Cristobal. That's an ugly name. A scary name, you know? Name that I never really truly heard. Me and him ended up going at it, you know? Third grade, second grade, whatever. And um, that was that time. So, you know, so when it came to the gangs and stuff like that, even in school, public school, in Bushwick, was it, it was infested. Like you had to be in a gang. Wow. In the school. Even in elementary school. Even in elementary school, that's right. But, you know. So then, you know, from there, you know, I used to always walk back and forth and be outside by myself. There was times you was not allowed to go around the block, I promise you. <laughs> so I ride my bike. Like, if you lived on Star Street, you better stay on Star Street, that's it. Neutral grounds was the park. Right. Everywhere else, on that street. Unless you had love, because it'd be Star Street, but it'd be two other blocks. Star Street across the street from Nick, in the middle, and then you had the other cars. I mean, Star Street from um, PS one eleven, um, Junior High School one eleven. Beautiful thing, you know. Whatever. That's the only place you had to be a Star Street boy. Yeah. You couldn't go to Trotman. You couldn't go this way. No, that's not gonna happen. No will it be Street for you, buddy. So that's the way I grew up in one block. But this block was always infested with a lot of kids, a lot of boys in this block. So that's when I started, you know, learning how to have real friends and learning new things. I had time, you know, not school thing. Now I'm learning about street life. So I was always outside now, you know. 
old school style. Anthony, get upstairs, it's already 8 o'clock. That's my mother. She could whistle from 20 blocks away. I could hear that whistle. But then that's when, um, you know, that's when the b-boy and the hip-hop and all that started coming into my life. Right. At that early, early years, at 1975. Wow. It's when, you know, like my mother, my mother also. Early, you're six years old. I'm only six years old. Even my mother, during her early age, was in a gang in Bushwick. It was called the Black Diamonds. So she was in that gang. She used to, she said she was the, the peace, the peace one. I'm not too sure what they call it. But she used to go to other gangs to make sure that she, you know, so she would be the one, to, like an ambassador. Right. To try to make neutral grounds. And so she was, <laughs> she was pretty high up in that gang. It was called the Black Diamonds, right? After that, no matter what, so everybody knew my mother. So, but my block was one of those blocks very, very entertaining, very active. I learned how to pitch, how to play baseball, how to play, you know, punch ball. We lived, that block was very athletic. Everybody used to have, we used to, you know, it was a hill block. And we used to race from the bottom of the block all the way up. Who was the fastest runner? It was a very, very, you know, for Bushwick, was very different. Like, if, if I could pick up Star Street and take it away and put it somewhere else with all my friends during that time, I would have. Because the rest of their neighborhood didn't match. Everybody else was just living dirty. You know, these kids were dressed in clean. Everybody was already competition. That's when I had a boy named Victor. And he used to take the Pumas. That's when all the Pumas and, and all these sneakers started coming into the hip hop world, right? But I had a friend called Victor. He was like two years older than me. And he was already the type that used to put like um, what you call it like um, checkerboards on the on the sneakers on the laces lace he used to do designs if this guy was ready boom you know okay mind you we're still walking around with pro kids or converse whatever with you know super tight shorts this guy was already walking around with like you know the tigers and light leaves and you know early 70s you know when it was first coming but he already knew how to put it together that's right so he taught me how to, how to be a casual urban, you know, dresser, you know, a street dresser, but putting street, this was a different kind of form. It wasn't no bell bottoms, remember the seventies, mm -hmm. big afros. I refused that. I used to follow Victor, whatever he did. Then I had my other buddy, his name was Butchie. He was my bodyguard, you know, older than me. That I remember one day he bought me my first peak coat. The little kid bought me a, a, a peak coat, you know, but he was my bodyguard. Now, there's a reason why I say these things mm -hmm. because you know it's, it's a killer. But the thing is, is that I remember when I one day I was walking down the block going to school, and I'm hearing that song. Um, I said, "A hip hop, a hip to the hip of the hip hip hop," and I was like, "Wow, well, you know something different." I never heard this kind of jam like, "And the chicken tastes like wood." You no, know? <laughs> oh, you know that's when that came in. You know that part of my, you know. Okay, wait a minute. So, mind you, I'm young. I'm exploring by myself. I've been through a lot of it at an early age. But new things were coming in, you know? And um, and then I remember when um, one day I was on the block and there was a bunch of kids that just came in the block and they were older than me, you know, teenagers, big boys, you know what I'm saying? And, and they were like, and I was sitting on my stoop and, and just looking, they just all grown running. And then I see a whole bunch of people just ganging up on you know, surrounding and people looking like they were fighting. But they wasn't fighting. So I'm like I'm scared, you know, because you know when you you know when you live a violent life, you know, you can just drop a, a pen and you're gonna jump. So I was always nervous, like, you know, very, very on the defensive side. And I'm looking and I'm looking and they're going up and down, they bang, doing all these moves. I'm like, what, the, what is this? What is this? I'm like, well, whatever, I liked it. Because I seen they were fighting, but they right. wasn't fighting. And they were battling. You know, they didn't even have names for it yet, all right? So. What year was that? That was year 1975, 1976. Okay. A lot of things happened within those years, fast. It, 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 was, it was like a tornado for me. I was, I was like a sponge soaking things up, learning, you know, like, you know, that's how I guess when, um, I guess, you know, from not knowing to curiosity kicks in. Right, right. So curiosity kicked in, and I was always... Always looking for something, seeing, hearing something. Oh, what the hell is that? You know, learning. Nobody was teaching me, so I was learning 
from my real father, the streets. You know, so I learned, and I seen that up block. They didn't even have a name yet for it. There was a bunch of guys, and then they used to always be on the block. Then they used to battle on the Nicaragua. Then they used to go to eleven and battle. Then my cousin came, his name was Ruben, and he told me what it, you know, it'd be, you know, and I seen him battling because. And my uncle came and they were doing it. That's, you know, I'm, I'm already into it. You know, I was already 1975, hit 1975. I was already jumping around, you know, battling with them, practicing, learning this 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 new art form. And um, my cousin was called. He was in a, in a crew that I remember. He came with the shirt and it said, Touch a Rock. And the kids that were battling up and down the block was um, Ed, Carlo, Danny. There was a few other people. And they were known as um, Dynasty Rockers. Okay. okay. So they were Dynasty Rockers right there in Bushwick. All right. People want to know, a uh, rocker came from Bushwick. Okay, what anybody says. And then um, what happened? Um, eventually, now they were wearing shirts too, like Touch a Rock. Uh -huh. And they had the Dynasty colors. And because during that time, he wasn't allowed to wear colors unless he was a real gang. They didn't know what crew it was. Nobody knew what a crew was. Nobody knew what none of that stuff was. They only knew what gangs was. And if you wear colors, you're gonna catch it. You know. And that's in the early before the Warriors. So let's put that, you know. So mm -hmm. now I remember one day it was Carlos when I was a little kid and, and I used to battle with them. I used to, you know, jump in there, six years old, and they used to like it. You know? And not only me, it was a whole bunch of kids in the block. Mm -hmm. and like I tell you, it was a boy block. And for some reason, they used to like to battle in that area because it was always infested with boys. So it wasn't only me, it was a whole bunch of us in the block. They used to battle each other, little kids. So they they put us as, you know, and um, they gave me a jacket. It was sort of a jacket like this, but that material jacket. You remember who gave me that jacket? I uh, can't quite remember. I'm thinking it was Carlos, right? So I was so young. He knew my mother. Okay. My mother was already well known. So I remember, I said, oh, I want to, so I guess my mother must have told him. And they came with a jacket saying Anthony in the back, and in the bottom it said Dynasty. I had that jacket since I was, since my kid was born. But by the time he hit eight years old, I don't know what happened to the jacket. I had the jacket for so many years, but, you know, that's a good story. So, but at least I remember all that stuff, you know? So now, mind you, the 76, 60, I mean, 1976, a lot of things started, you know, you know, all that dancing was kicking in. Everybody's, something was different. But then, let's just say 1980, 1978 came in, right? So 1978 came in. 1978, um, what happened in 1978? Um, now we're starting to get ugly again. So the gangs were coming back. Got it. And the up rocking was dissolving. You remember the names of those gangs that were coming back? There were all kinds of gangs. Dude, too many gangs. All I know is that my life was Bushwick. Summertime came. Called my grandmother, gave me the Coney Island, even though they had their own gangs out there. Mm -hmm. Now, those gangs out there was um, like homicides, was. Um, Dirty Riders. Who else was in that gang? There was um, God's Children's. You know, um, there was a uh, other other gang. I can't quite remember a couple of other gangs, but those were the three biggest ones. Got it. And they were all united, like you know. So during '78 and stuff like that, you know, I was back and forth and all that stuff. You know, even all all, all my life. So one day in 1978. 79, my mother has her sister, which my aunt, her name is Chicky. And my cousin Ruben was out there too. That's the one that was in Touch Rock. He used to live in Bushwick with, with my grandmother. So, you know, whatever I did, he did the same way. So I'm the first grandchild on my father's side. My cousin Ruben is the first grandchild in my mother's side, you know, grandmother's side, on the mother's side. So he was always my buddy. My defender, my everything, you know, so I learned a lot from him. Actually, you could say that he was like the father I never had during those times of my life. And I, if somebody was going to jump me, I know I couldn't beat him, man. I would call him 
Paul was taken care of because he was a fighter. So it was Brighton Beach that he lived in. And we went to his house and we hung out. And it was so beautiful because it was a part of the Brooklyn that I'd never been there, even though I've been in Coney Island all my life. And I never knew about Brighton Beach. Yeah. Just okay. a little walk down the road. Just a little walk down the road. Coco Tasso, if I walk down the road. That's right. So I, you know, I respect too, you know, so especially my grandmother. I <laughs> find I was in, in Brighton Beach at seven years old, you know, <laughs> beating out with a gallon from her. She was a tough lady. Let's, let's not talk about my grandmother. That's a different <laughs> story. So then um, we moved, we went there, we visited my aunt, and it was real cool. I remember because, you know, it was time to go home. Then we was on the train station. During that time, the M train used to go from Brighton Beach straight to Bushwick. Remember they used to have all the graffiti on it? Oh, man, it was real hip-hop era. So, all right, so now we're back in Bushwick. Gangs are coming back. And now what's happening in, during that time was people were getting killed. Neighbors, friends, little by little. I seen uh, this kid called Washington that he passed away. That they killed him right next door to him. A good friend of mine. So I remember, you know, he's always been in my house. A little, a little older than me, of course. But then um, one day I was walking towards school, school time, you know, cold. And I'm walking with my brother and my sister. We're in the side of, on Star Street, but on Nickabaca Park. And we're walking down. And I'm holding them and I'm looking up and I'm looking up. And I kept seeing them because it was like real early because we used to get up because my mother was lazy. So to eat breakfast, mm -hmm. we used to have to get up early. So I'm walking, I'm walking, and I look up, and I noticed, okay, wait a minute. A man hanging off of one of those buildings with a rope around his neck, naked, all stabbed up with blood dripping down. Wow. Okay? That was the icing of the cake for my life. My brother seen it. I pushed his face. I pushed my sister's face. I didn't want them to see that. Real scary stuff. And I didn't know, you know, so I ran to the school. Now I'm horrified. You, you know, when you're in the middle mm -hmm. of the block and you're like, well, home or the school? I don't know what happened. Well, I've seen this death at an early age. I ran to the school. I told the school about it. I, that's when all the cops came, blah, blah, blah. And sure enough, the person that was in that building was also my neighbor, but the father of the, of the other kid that just got killed with his name was Washington. So that was his father up there. That was it. So now I was on the depressing mode, you know, right. because I know, you know, now it's too close for comfort. And I was worried, you know. So then all of a sudden, uh, one day, my mother fell in love with this guy. He just became a step pops, good guy. You know, he was a, uh, my mother transformed his life also. So I guess in turn, he wanted to transform our life. So one day he asked me, hey, why you look so sad? Why are you so depressed? And I told him the truth. I don't want to be in Bushwick no more. I'm scared. I don't want to be out here no more. So then, you know, he finally noticed, and then my mother noticed that I was always depressed and wanted to go outside. And then sure enough, um, my, my step pops, you could say, turned to mine and said to me, um, so what do you want to do? I said, I, will, I want to move towards Brighton Beach, where my cousin Ruben and them is. And um, six months later, he bought a house in Brighton Beach and moved it and took me out of there. So, you know. Awesome. Yeah, that was that part. You know, it's hard to say goodbye to all my friends, though. Right. You know, but I was thinking about my, my brother, you know, thinking about my mother, thinking about my, even my, my step pops and myself. Mm -hmm. I know it was, it was, uh, I already knew something I smelled in my body, something I felt in my body that was telling me, Joe, let's go. And they took me, thank God, you know. So we ended up on this block called 10 Court on Coney Avenue between that two and Coney Avenue. Went out there, you know. Um, remember all that up rock and stuff kind of died down, but it was still in my blood. Right. We'll get that twisted. It was in my blood. So now I go to Brighton Beach. Nobody knows me. I'm a hebato from Bushwick, <laughs> walking around with pinch stripes and penny loafers. And now I'm in the fifth grade in a new school, you know. So that's how fast things turned around. I was in the fifth grade. I think I left back. That's how, and you know, a lot of things happened during that depression, you know. Mm -hmm. I wasn't focusing on things, but I was also, there was times that, you know, I would do things like poetry, right? That 
Mrs. Fatnow was saying, oh, we need to skip him. And my mother said, no, he's too small. I'm scared we're going to beat him or whatever. So, I mean, us, my, my, my school life was up like this, I promise you, up and down, up and down. All right? I can tell you that, too, if you want to hear it. But let me tell you, because all this is a part of it. So now I ended up in, um, what you call it, Piers 253 in Brighton Beach. Met new friends. My uncle was there from Leo. He, my cousins were there, you know, all my family, you know, that that I love the most. I used to live in Bush, but now in Brighton Beach. And they were all everybody. So it was a beautiful thing. Pinstripe started school in Brighton Beach. And um, I remember that um, I was wearing a suit and the kids were laughing at me. And the same thing that happened in, in, two, in, in PS123, that they followed me and they um, was joking on me. <laughs> and I remember that I was in, I turned around and it was, there was three of them. One of them was called Johnny Tomato, the other one was called Nat, and I can't I don't remember the other kid. So I turned around and I said, listen, not for nothing, I'm not a joker. And you're not gonna wanna test me. And they, were, they were like, oh really? It's their neighborhood, you know? And they did, they kept going down the steps and I turned around and I started beating the shit out of all three of them. I beat them all the way down the steps. Then after that, I, took, I went home and I took my suit off and I never put that on again. Penny loafer, that was gone out the window. I'm still in New Jack town as, you know, my mother moved in during the summertime, so it was the beginning of school years. So there was another kid up there, you know, that I met, his name was Papo, and his, I felt, I became his friend because of his sister. I fell in love with her, her name was Lisa, gorgeous girl, but anyway, Papo was a good kid, you know. That's when the first dirt bikes came out, remember those dirt bikes? Uh -huh. I was the only one in that neighborhood who had a dirt bike. Oh, actually, Johnny Tomato had one because he was a sport rotten bastard because his father owned a lot of buildings. So he got anything. That's the, one, that's the one that was laughing at me because he was always dressed like Prince Charles because he had Prince Charles money. Right. I didn't. So you want to laugh at my pinstripes? Well, then, you know, you caught a beacon. That was that. That's because I, I it was in, in my genes already from Bushwick. I didn't want to, but I'm going to defend myself. I'm not going to be your mockery, I promise you that. And like I said, I was never a follower. So that wasn't going to happen. And after that, I met Juan. You know, on Ten Court, he used to be a little, he was from East New York, I believe. He just moved around the block too. And he used to be all the way up the block. And I'm like, oh boy, you know, what's going on here, you know? And Papa was like, oh, he's a quiet one, you know, he's new jack, whatever, you know. I mean, they didn't talk like that, but you know, that's what he's trying to tell me. Mm -hmm. But then um, I found out that the kid up there didn't like nobody on the block. They didn't like Papa. That was his kid, that, that was my boy's, you know, my friend's name, Papa. And, um, so, but one thing about me, I knew he wasn't a fighter. But I grew up always only with fighter friends. And there was a reason for that. Because if I get jumped, you better help me. If you're walking with me, you know? Mm -hmm. So a lot of my friends had to be. So, you know, I was already a tester. So I already knew him. But I, I didn't test him because I liked his, girl, his sister. So I left him alone, played that nice innocent role for him. Different world for me. I don't want to bring that Bushwick stuff into, you know, to Brighton Beach. Not yet, at least. So then uh, I made Papo fight Juan. Because I, you know, I, I got to make sure something that he's not really 100% soft at that early age. <laughs> so then um, I went up the block with him and I said, hey, Juan, come over here. I didn't know the kid's there. He wants to fight you. The kid got up. He, he, he want to fight me? Them to fight. No, the kid actually got up to fight him and he ran away, Papa. All right, so he wanted to fight. Now, who ended up fighting was me and him. Because the kid asked me, Who are you now? He kid is about two or three years older than me. He was taller than me during that time. And then um, me and him fought. I'm like, the one, I'm like, I'm not the one who's going to run. I promise you, I told him. And we stood and we fought for like about 20 minutes. Little kids. 16th, I mean, fifth grade. Fighting, he was older. He was probably was in the radio in sixth grade, seventh grade. We, you know, you know how us, you know, not living the golden spoon life, mm -hmm. we're gonna get left back, you know, but you know, whatever. So but it was always rough, you know. Certain people had it good, especially those that had fathers. Those that didn't, it's not that it's not that easy. So. 
before we became best friends. But I still didn't, you know, abolish the other one. But because of me and him becoming best friends, I made him and Papa become best friends. So that was the beginning of that. So now I, now I, at least I knew I had a fighter that could keep up with me. So that was good. There goes my buddy. So we became really, really close, you know. Papa was really close to him, you know. But he was the one, you know, like, God made me go with this kid. And, you know, we started hanging out. We started hanging out and um, to the point that this little block 10 court was um, started getting packed in with friends. Because now you got the Johnny Tomato, you got Naz, they were already my friends. One, nobody looked like at him, but eventually we started getting more friends, you know, because I was already collecting everybody like cards. Mm -hmm. See, I was in, I, I had an agenda. They didn't know that. So then, um, before you know it, the block started getting packed up the way it used to look on Star Street. I wanted that same image, and that's why I did that. And they used to all hang out on my block on 10 Court. Now, now the, that was the block. 10 Court became the block. Everybody, all the kids used to go there. All the girls used to go there. It got, you know, bop, 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 to the point that it was more people coming. And then, um, but there was, um, breakdancing wasn't even, you got kicking in like that. You know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. Up rocking. But yet gangs were still kicking in. Unfortunately, in Brighton Beach, they did have a gang. And it was called the Dragon Brothers. Chance was the leader. Um, fortunately, that the Godfather and the one Chance was scared of was my cousin, who was the leader of the God's children, and his name was Pablito Cubiana. But I never want nobody to know who was my family, you know? Not even my cousin Ruben, you know, I didn't want, like, because I already knew me. I never wanted to get my family involved in my world, period. So the less I tell you my name, the less I tell you who's my cousin, the better it is. Or even, like, if you knew where I live, it's because I told you where. But if somebody else said, that's a problem, that's going to be a problem. Even at that early age, I promise you. And um, so now we're starting moving around. The guy chanced didn't like me because I didn't take crap from nobody. And one day he threatened me. Big boy, 18 years old, 17 years old. You know, you know, I'll get somebody to beat your butt, get your butt. Somebody, every time he brings somebody to beat my butt, I whip their ass. His name was Danny, Jorge, I don't care who it was. He bring. So one day he went and bragged my cousin, Wally, from Coney Island, who's the little brother of Pablito, who's the leader of God's children. He didn't know that. So my man won, whatever. But this chance was too much, you know. He, he, did a third, he did a 360 eventually, you know, with me. But during that time, that was my enemy, mm -hmm. a leader of a gang. I'm a new Jack, and you're already, I'm already an enemy, so whatever. So then he was walking with this short guy that was dressed with MC gears, MC boots, rebel hat, chains and everything, and I'm walking. And, you know, during that time, I wasn't even dressed like that, you know? And I looked at my own. Um, my buddy Juan, and Juan was already nervous. I'm really scared of. And then I said, "Watch this. Don't worry about it." And he's bringing, "Yo, Anthony." Cause they didn't even call me here. I get it. Yo, Anthony. Anthony, I talk to you. I got somebody for you. I'm like, really? And I kept looking at him in his face, and my cousin was looking at him, and looking at me, and looking at Chance, and looking at me. Then he went and walked towards me. Because at first, Wally said, who do you want me to fight? Him? And he was pointing at my man, Juan. He said, no, 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 him. Oh, so you want me to fight my cousin? That's what you're telling me? That little, I'm telling you, these kids. Let's just put it like this. My cousin, Wally, at an early age, was already walking with shotguns at eight years old. Now, I don't even want to tell you whatever he ever did. But all I know is that they was not playing at those, day, those ages. That's why I don't trust kids from seven years old, and I don't care if you're seven years old to 107 years old. I will fill go your ass down the block if I see that my life is gonna be threatened because I don't trust even the seven years old because I know my own family, mm -hmm. how they grew up. All right, so, Wally was definitely scared of him. Wally went and turned around and looked at me, so you want me to find my cousin? When, when, when Dwayne seen that, his face turned from up. No, because he's black, but light skinned black, he just got pale. And that was that. Because he already knew he was in trouble. 
So then after that, now he wasn't my enemy no more. Now he seen that I was a sort of a leader, like, and all my friends that were following me, there was no joke either because every one of them I tested. Mm -hmm. And then after that, he tried to make uh, some bond and I was young then, about 10 years old. And um, so we formed the gang. We became a new division. And the name of our gang was called the Young Dragon Brothers. So now we're running around with MC boots and chasing other gangs, you know, <laughs> and, right, right. for his name. But then time goes on. Now we're running around being mad habits. I was 10 years old walking around with an ax, you know? So whatever I was running away from in Bushwick, I ended up, it ended up catching up to me anyways. Mm -hmm. But I'm better there than over there in Bushwick, I promise you that. So from there, I remember we used to do, you know, we was already beating, you know, have like five little kids beating up on a 25 years old guy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't one, it wouldn't be five of us. So that's how bad we was at that. You know, the oldest one would be 12 years old. Imagine having a 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, all the little kids beating the crap out of you and you're a 30 years old man, all muscular, gangster, and was was scared of those little ones. <laughs> they were more they were more scared of us than they were scared of the other gangsters, the bigger boys. Because when we jump and we go and take you, we knew how to take you down, we'll grab your leg, bring you back up. Dude, no joke. Sorry to explain that one. But anyway, and um one day I was walking down Conan Avenue from the beach, from the boardwalk, mm -hmm. and um this guy came up to me. You know, I've seen him walking from a distance and I'm walking with seven of my friends and we all MC down and all gangster looking. But we're little kids. And the real gangster came out. His name was called Daddy O. Now, Daddy O came out. He just finished doing like three or four or five years. I'm not too sure for doing some crazy thing that they all does. He was part of the homicides from Coney Island. But they knew me from Coney Island since I was a kid. And they grew up with my family out there. So one day he goes, yo, Anthony, that's you? Come over here. I was real scared because, you know, now I know who I'm playing with. Like, that's real fire. And that's why Tense was scared of those guys because those guys were real fire. <laughs> Salute. So anyway, so that's why I'm telling you the story. You know, you want to know? I'm gonna let you know how I see it. You know. So now, mind you, you know all the, you know, everything is still evolving. All the, you know, beats are coming in, the music's coming in, this is coming in. Gangs is really still in. It really came back in. Everybody can say it. I don't care what anybody says. So a lot of people start up rocking. They'll say it. All that went out the window for a short period of time. Then something else kicked in. So then during that time, I was 10 years old, you know, beginning of the summer. And um, Daddy told me, hey, he took his handkerchief off from his head. And he put it in the floor. And now he started using, you know, all those, you know, stars, teardrops, symbolic stuff, you know, for a meeting. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. He's like, oh, what's the teardrops for? The seven of us. Half of us play hooky every day. Think we know what the hell the stars for? What's the chair drop for? What's this one? Well, I'm gonna tell you. The stars are the police when they lock you up. Or even maybe, you know, whatever. What are the tear drops for? Have you ever seen like real handkerchief? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they real good. He, he made meaning for all of them, but the ones that took, the, the two that kicked in was the star and the tear drop for me. And then he goes to me, so what's the teardrop for? We're looking at each other, MC hats, rebel hats. We're not even, but I used to love to get dressed like that. For some reason, I, I liked it. I just liked it to look different, you know, to look like a warrior. Let's just put it like that. And um, he goes, well, the teardrops is your mother crying. Or your grandmother or somebody who loves you because you're in jail doing many years. Or you're dead. And I said, and I looked around, everybody was like, you know, whatever. And I'm like, all right, whatever. And um, after that, it kicked in to the point that I said, um, I told my man Juan, which he was the vice president of the Young Dragon Brothers, and Jack was the, the president. They wanted to make me the president, but I already knew that the president is usually the ones who will catch it real hard. So that was the only time I didn't try to be a leader, especially for a real gang like that, right? So I made Jack president because he reminded me of my cousin Pablito. Looked like a gang leader, which he also had an attitude, just like mean, scary looking kid, like that kid, um, Cristobal. You know, he was a Cristobal kind of look. My cousin Pablito's a Cristobal kind of look. 
So those are real gangs, so, you know, ready to go. They don't care, whatever. But then I told the vice pres, which I made him the vice pres, and I made Jack the vice pres because I didn't want to go there. At an early age, I was already telling people who were going to be leaders, right? And they told me, um, and I said, no, I'm going to quit the gang. I don't want this. Because I thought about my mother. And I ain't trying to make my mother suffer, and I ain't trying to do no time for something stupid that we could do real quick. So I said, you know what? It's over for me. So now they're like, oh, you really, really? You know, you're going to have to go through the Apache line. You're going to have to go through this, through that. Okay, I'll take it. And sure enough, I went through the Apache line. And they had um, 12 members, adults, you could say, and one side from Dragon Brothers and 12 members from God's children's side. And I had to go through that Apache line. And I went through it. I took the ass whipping because I'd rather take it than... Just like Daniel says, being in jail for life or being dead. So it's, a, it's just a moment of pain. I've been through it all my life. Right. Don't worry about it. I'm going through it. All the way across. I made it. Then I turned around and I looked at my man, Juan. And I said, yo, um, you coming? He was scared. But sure enough, for the love he had for me, <laughs> he went through it. The only ass with him too. They beat him to the point that he got knocked out. Mind you, he's two years older than me. So that wasn't giving him little tap tap. They were giving him hard taps. Right. They dropped him. I ran back into that um, Apache line and dragged my buddy out. Dragged him out at 10 years old, catching, getting kicked by MC boots, getting punched in the head. And my man was already knocked out. And, like real war. Right. You know, you get him out of the, you know, the war. I, was, I took him out. And then after that, um, we stopped hanging out in the neighborhood for a little bit. And that's when I started going back to Bushwick, started going, you know, sitting there, see my old friends. So, hey, what's my buddy? And, um, yeah. So, you know, so like my first mentor, you know, was Daddio. Because if it was not for him, I still would have been in gangs. So he taught me how to get out of the gang, not how to get into it, you know, even though he was a, old dirty bastard himself, you know? Right. But he got me out of there, you know? That's my first mentor. So then, um, like I said, um, I got away from the neighborhood. Me and Juan got away from the neighborhood, kind of separated, you know, gang era, you know, you got, you know, can't trust nobody. Mm -hmm. We just left the gang. You know, we don't know what's going on, you know what I'm saying? Try to leave a gang nowadays, see what happens. So I ended up going back to Bushwick, going, East New York, Bushwick is right over the bridge, you know, learning, you know, seeing things and exploring, finding myself back again, my, at least my kid life, not trying to be an adult, you know? And then that's when I found out that they killed my boy, um, Butchie, which he was like about maybe 13 years old. And they shot him like about 40 times in the corner of um, Star Street, but up the block towards where um, 111 was. So that was, he was gone already. And then um, that was enough to make me like, okay, let me stop hanging out back in this neighborhood. There was a reason why I left. Mm -hmm. Some of my boys were still there. You know, I said, you know, whoever still left for a while, you know, but uh, time goes on, of course. Ended up coming back. Um, one day me and my buddy, I started hanging out. And then we started hearing about, I seen somebody do a hespin. I'm not too sure if it was in Bushwick, but I seen somebody do a head spin and I wanted to know what it was. You know, like, well, wait a minute, what's this? I never seen this before. And then um me and Wall started hanging out. That year was, like I said, 19, 1980, 19, you know, still mm -hmm. still young. Maybe other things already happened. Other people continue to do what they think. I'm still a kid, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll tell you the truth, you know, you come to look at a lot of these pioneers. They're all older than me, all of them. So I, I'm, I'm, I am them, but just younger. But if it was not for my older brothers, then I would never been me, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, it was dumb that, um, you know, even from Crazy Lakes, you know, even from Carlos, you know, even from, um, you know, even ACS with um, dynamic um, um, breakers or rockers. Mm -hmm. They changed it. Oh, I didn't break it. The Rockers first, and then we had to break it. I don't know what happened there. But whatever. So then, um, first time I seen, um,
crazy dude lay do um, something in the TV. I don't know what it was. That was it. I wanted to break that. And I started practicing and learning and doing this. During that time, me and my boy, Juan, we used to watch a lot of trip, I mean, Chinese Kung Fu movies, you know, we used to go to 42nd Street, we used to see this, you know. So we was already getting into back flipping and front flipping and always fighting, you know, acting up, you know, but doing, you know, what was happening in the Chinese, you know, stuff. And then um, one day we see a, a movie, that's when we see the Crazy Lady again, and we was like, hey, wait, wait a minute, you know, but we was already starting to break dance, you know, we was already, and then I said, okay, well, we're gonna form the, the crew. And I formed the crew, right, during 1981. So in 1981, I remember me and my boy, um, Juan, and I was saying, I'm gonna make a, a crew. He didn't know what a, a, a breakdance crew. How oh, was a breakdance crew? They didn't even know what it was. And then <laughs> one day, my boy Jack, that was the leader of the gang over there, he, he, he knew what I was talking about. He threw himself on top of his head and he did a head spin. I said, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So from there, I kept, you know, learning and learning from everybody. You know, kept going here, kept going, went to um, Coney Island. That's when um, I, I used to hang out with um, Speed. Okay. And so me, me and Speed and the Bandit, then the Twins. So they they were already on top of this, you know. Mind you, know, they're, they're older than me. They know more than me. I didn't know. You know, I was too busy acting like a fool. So after that, um, I was thinking of a cruise thing at 10 years old, going to be 11 years old. So at 11 years old, actually, during the summer of 1981, hanging out with my boy, we was already thinking about a breakdance crew name. Now, mind you, my cousin comes in, Ruben, with his buddy, Todd Terry, which is a music producer, probably one of the fathers of house music. And he's walking in there with my cousin, and he goes to me, and I'm asking him, what would be a nice name for a crew's name? And like, what the hell is a crew's name? What the hell is a crew, period? <laughs> I'm not, it's like, like the gang, you know, crew. So I had to put it in their head. So whatever. My cousin says something, but then Todd Terry says something else. And he said twice as nice. And me and Juan looked at each other, and I'm like, it's pretty nice. And then I said, oh, then I asked him, I said, why why twice as nice? Why, why would that be a nice name for, you know, he didn't even know about breakdancing or that yet, right? I said, well, well you know, he goes, because um, use them both twice as nice. So when we said, he said, when he said both of us, we looked at it and I said, so I must be twice and he must be nice. That's the way we saw it. And um, after that, um, we that was the name. And we started flipping and break dancing and break dancing and then we were going around battling people because mm -hmm. now we wanted to test it, you know, see what's up. And we battled a few people, Furious Rockers, Break to Dawn, Nasty with Rock, other crews that we probably didn't even know who was battling. Because they used to, a lot of people used to come to Brighton Beach and hang out. We used to throw cardboards and all that stuff. And they used to start right. spinning. And we used to battle them too. We didn't care who it was. What does the word B-boy mean to you? Where does the B come from? To me, I'm going to go with the history of some of these pioneers, first of all. Because there's, to me, it's up rocking. And let's just say bottle breaking, right? Mm -hmm. So up rocking is that, bottle breaking is that. B-boy to me, no matter how anybody sees it, you know, because at first it's called, you know, break dancing, whatever. But the B I will always see no matter what is Brooklyn and Bronx. Just like they say, um, Bronx can make it, but Brooklyn would definitely put it in a different level. Got it. So, yeah, you know, like, you know, how to explain that, but um, yeah, you know, that's why a lot of people in the Bronx, you know, they try to bury Brooklyn for some reason. When um, actually, we was I I've seen people do suicides with their up rocking in Bushwick many years ago. I used to see when they used to spin on their knees and freeze while they were battling. You know what I'm saying? So, but we never knew it was called break dance. We didn't know it yet. You know, I didn't know none of that stuff. So, but the b boy to me means um. Yeah, exactly what I said. Not only does it mean the Bronx boys, 
it also means the Brooklyn Boys. So the beat, I, I, I can take that. I can take that beat. People also say, oh, breakdance. Yeah, that's what we used to call it. We used to call it breakdance. Then they want to switch it up to b-boy. Then they were right. talking about, oh, that came from the Bronx and this, but what about Brooklyn? But then when you say that, they slow down. Damn. They have to slow down. Because guess what? In 1973, Dynasty Rockers was running around. And where the world rockers came from. Why is it there's a lot of breakdancing names, crews out there, like Dynamic Rockers, that why they had to switch it? Because they wanted to upgrade themselves? Why there was, um, um, let's say, um, the Furious Rockers, you know, why they call themselves Rockers, you know, or Incredible Rockers. You know, why they say all these names? But they always switched it to Rockers. Everybody switched their name, but I never switched mine. Mm -hmm. I left it as Rockers. So, you know, I thought it was part of the uprocking world, you know? Right. Which it is. Because how, how can you how can you just throw yourself on the floor, do a few windows? That's it. No, no, you have to. Back is first. Woo! Throw yourself into an elbow spin, get back up, stop up rocking again. Oh, slide to the floor, maybe do another trim meal. It's just not throw yourself on the floor, spin in the back, and that's it. No, there's a part to it. What were you known for in breaking? What what, what was your strength, your forte? Rocking, popping, I'm gonna floor? You, I'm gonna tell you. So mind you, remember, early years, I was always into dancing. So I used to watch a lot of that Soul Train stuff too. And I was already talking about the robot. Hello, you know? And then I seen the up rocking. So I got locking and I got up rocking. But then break dancing came in. So now I got locking, breaking, up rocking, all that together. And I do all of them. I can, I can, Pop, block, wave. I can up rock, freeze, burn you. Or I can do trim meals, windmills, head spins, elbow spin, 1990s too. And I can do gymnastics too. And not only that, I can also do routines and form routines with the, with the rest of the crew. And um, so I was known for everything. Nice, nice. And uh, when, when it comes to the music, right? I mean, uh, you, need, you need those beats. What? In your opinion, or just personally, what is your b-boy anthem? Name me the top three right, that the, you would the rock top to. Three, the top three was definitely the Apache, the Mexican, and the one with Jelly Bean. Got it. The Mexican with Jelly Bean. The Jelly B Bean. The, right, you got the Apache, Just Begun, and Mexican. And Mexican. Sweet. Those Sweet. are the three. Those are the three B boy break dancing. Still, I don't care if you up rocking or break dancing. That is the, you can say the anthem of yeah. of, of the B boy world. Now to get it right, so twice as nice was established in 1981. 1981. Who existed before 1981 rocking crews? Well, you had the um, um rock steady crew. You had the um. Incredible, um, the Incredible Breakers was out already. Um, Furious Rockers, Break to Dawn. You also had um, Dynamic Rockers. And um, because you see, the, those are the only ones that I focused on until I met the Magnificent Force, which, which was a made up crew of all of them. Oh, really? Yeah. Talk to me about that. Magnificent Force was a crew that was made up by a bunch of other crew members from other crews. That's why not one of the Magnificent Force can ever say that they are true Magnificent Force because that name themselves was was um, made by somebody else who emerged them so they can make money. God. See? I'm not going to... Even New York City Breakers, and that's the truth. Because New York City Breakers, I love them and everything, and they gifted, right? But... But that name, New York City Breakers, was not made by Chino or somebody who was, it was made by somebody else who holds the rights to that name. And that's the only thing I don't like. It's all those B-boy crews out there who changed their name. And they should have always kept it their original name. That's it. Just like Break the Dawn. Break the Dawn, I love them. And switch the name to Fresh Kids. I love it. But Break the Dawn was my was the name for them forever. You know, I was there. So if you was to talk to other b-boys out there and say, oh, do you remember Fresh Kids? I'm like, oh, Fresh Kids. But the minute you said, do you remember Break to Dawn? Oh, yeah, man, they were a real good crew. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, you know, like Floor Masters, right? Mm -hmm. Floor Masters, you know, so 
New York City Breaker, but which I love the name New York City Breaker to me was very inspiring. Mm -hmm. If anything, I thought they were like the magnificent force when it was a whole bunch of pioneers that went into one crew. Because it was just the perfect name. Mm -hmm. But that's why I still love them to this day because to me, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Our crew was inspired by the New York City Breakers. We wanted to be like them. So when it came to that point of life where we were able to challenge any of those suckers, we want them, to, you know, maybe we won't win, but you're going to recognize us, you know, because we used to practice and practice and pra do everything. Wow. What did you practice at? When we, when we started, it was in 10 court. Okay. Right in Brighton Beach over there, in the beach, in the sand. We used to learn how to do a lot of things. See, that was the, that was the benefit about having, living in Brighton Beach. A lot of people don't know it was that beach. Right. See, because the beach makes you strong. So now you can do 20 backflips on the sand. Come how many backflips you, you think you can do on the regular concrete? You know, you can do suicide, learn all these moves on the sand, then you know you're gonna you already know how to land. You know, right. So you, even do windmills, try to do a head spin in the sand. See if you don't break your neck. <laughs> my boy Fury, which is one, that's that's his big boy name. He was my vice president. Dude, when I mean he had the only bullet head spin. And I've seen a lot of people do head spins, and everybody respected him because mm -hmm. of that. Dude, that he would go so fast, you couldn't even see. You'll see his faces in every spot, like a bullet. And then he would just land like nothing. That's, that's, that's Fury. Wow. Wow. We're, um, now it's 1981. We're, you're a new crew. Were you, were you able to make the 1981 Lincoln Center battle? We were still young. We were still young. We were still young. We were still going out there battling with everybody. Our crew was the youngest pioneer crew, and I admit it. I don't care. Let them say it. When you have 11 years old, prez of a bunch of 50 years old kids that their parents can't control, that's pretty impressive. Okay, because a lot of these guys who were leaders, they were already a, leaders because of an adult person that created this crew that gave you the permission to be that leader. Mm -hmm. And then now you're the leader, but still they're older than me. Crazy Legs, how old is he? No, I know he's not 54 years old. You know, any of them, you know, Jose Speed, I know he's about three years older than me, but they were all old, about three years mm -hmm. older than me. So when they were like 15 years old or 14 years old, whatever, I was only 11 years old. So then you're a leader of a crew, but you're already a teenager. I'm just a little kid. That's kind of hard. Right, you know? right. Do you recall your mo most memorable battle, and who was it against? And why was it your most memorable battle? The one you enjoyed sticks in your head. The one that we always used to enjoy the most was always battling on, on Figures Rockers. Okay. Because, you know, I mean, like I said, there was only so many that I can say, oh, that's a marker. That's a marker. So these are, when I got to battle somebody who was a nobody, we we was focused, like I said, on New York City Breakers. We was focused on Rocksteady Crew. We was focused on Incredible Breakers and Dynamic. And we was also focused on Furious because those five, and even Break the Dawn, those six are the true pioneers of B-Boy World. Them, right there. Maybe there's other people out there who says, that, but they're the ones where the world, even to this day, knows who they are. And there was a reason for that. Because they were outstanding. All of them were outstanding breakers. And I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be like my big brothers. That's it. That was my goal. Did you ever take your crews to other neighborhoods to, I'm going to go battle to these Bushwick. guys? We battled so many crews, I can't remember. Oh, yeah. But. We were kids. We don't remember. You battle any Manhattan crews? I mean, I remember practicing with Magnificent Force, stretching out with them, you know? I was in the Big Break Dance Contest, 1983. All right, talk to us about that. It was an experience, you know? We got in there, and um, and I remember that, um, like I said, uh, I was real young then, and um, what, 13 years old, you could say? What was this at? Roxy's. Roxy, 1983, big break dance contest. We was already four of them. We was already up to that level. And we took it. 
that we're make, talking about making a movie. You know what? We want to be in that movie now. Now, we was hoping to challenge all of them in that big break dance contest, which we did, you know? And, um, but it was already fixed. It was already fixed for these guys who had agents who made up these names and took over their, their crew because they, all they wanted to do was, well, let's just put it, selling out themselves for stardom or something like that. And at the end of the day, they're still getting paid and we're not. They're mm -hmm. still doing things and we're not. Whatever, so I never sold myself to the devil, period. Mm -hmm. So I went to, went to the big break dance concerts, beautiful thing, you know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. um, we battled, we went up there. And I remember, you know, when I first unleashed um, the suicide flip on them, and it's something that I had learned from, uh, I was remember I used to like to watch a lot of um, Kung Fu movies. Mm -hmm. So I remember that I was, for a long time, I was always practicing this one move, and it was the suicide, stand on your back, and then just start jumping on your back and on your legs, but in a circle, go real fast, then land on your feet, then do a, a suit like a somersault, and land again in a freeze. And then I used to wind myself up into windmill, spin, 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 and then pop up and land on my foot. Again, that's a suicide. And that's how that's how nice I was already. You know, so but nobody else had this, you know, this, you know, they maybe they had suicide. For some reason I already put it in there because I did the suicide, but I used to do the back too. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Kids from Furious Rockets try to take that move from me. You know, I'm trying to say. And um that was that was one of it's very hard to do. Uh -huh. You know, I don't think that just everybody can just jump back and forth without using their hands, you know, it's martial arts stuff, you know, you know. So that was one, that, that was one move that I can say a lot of people didn't have, you know, but I see it still. There was only one kid that had it, but, but he saw it from me, but he can never do it like me, mm -hmm. you know. So now hanging out with the Magnificent Force during the time of the, the big, big breakdance contest, you know, that's when we met, that's when I met Icy Ice. Okay. And I also met um Joey and and, and, and Sat. I can't remember the name. There were two cousins that one of them became an actor. His name is Joe DeFazio. But you know, he was from Brooklyn too, you know. But they were real good kids, you know. They they had they used to grab each other's leg and spin in a circle, mm -hmm. like a wheel. Then they used to do that kick dance stuff and spin in a circle, go real fast, you know, awesome. Then I see Icy Ice and and then all of a sudden, um, I remember him doing the Arabian Tornado, he called it. And after that, um, I wanted to learn it. So that's when we became friends and we started hanging out here and there until he taught me the Arabian Tornado. And um, that's that power move that nobody had, only him. He created it. That's why Icy Ice is Icy Ice. I would never take the hit between him and, and everybody in the New York City Breakers and even Crazy Lakes. But there's only a few names that are, that can that can hit me. Right. You know, dynamic rockers is um or breakers are all right, but some of their names didn't hit me. You know, the ones that hit me was was the whole New York City breaking crew, um, Crazy Legs and Icy Ice, and Speed, and Bandit, because Bandit was no joke. Bandit, if, a lot of people don't say it, but they believe that he was the one who created Trimbios. Okay. And let me tell you about that spinning just around your head. My man was no joke. He taught me how to do trivials. That he used to go in a straight line. Imagine doing windmills, because windmills you go in a circle, right? Right. Trim meals, you can go in a circle too. But he was so nasty that he used to go in a straight line. Down the block. He, I, I learned it. My man Juan learned it. Speed didn't have it. Speed was nice too. Speed had the pop up windmills. The pop-up windmills is when you go down and you pop up. Go back down, pop up. He had that, he mastered that. So I learned that move from him. You know, that I used to do it so much that sometimes I used to pop up and land on my feet. Nice. You know, stuff like that. So, like, I don't know, God gave me that body, I guess, because you can be the, think in your mind, you know, hey, I could do that. But it's up to your body. Don't think it's easy. You know, and that's why I say, you know, a lot of these moves that a lot of these guys got in the future right now. No, man, that was through our blood, pain, tears. Mm -hmm. Well, because it hurt. Can, and sticking on that, can, 
it had to have taken a big toll on your body, your neck, your oh, shoulder. I can let you know about that. How you doing? I mean, mess it. Just like in the gang, you have to take punishment. Break dancing, it was like a gang, but then, you know, you're, but the challenge was you. And and gravity and concrete jungle, you know what I'm trying to say? So that's our punishment. We gave our own self our punishment just to do something different. You know what? When I first learned how to do windmills, do you know the hip bone back here? Mm -hmm. I used to have scars. Nobody taught me really like, you know, and nobody even taught them. So I'm sure they had the same scars. And eventually that scar became like the bottom of a, you know, let's say a, an elephant's feet becomes a layer. Right. And you don't feel it no more. Now you got to the point that you're not even hitting it no more. Could you walk faster? Again, we was all doing it. Now, at first we used to bang, bang. We didn't know. Now all these kids are spinning lovely. Why? Because they learned that from us. We taught, it was our being in punishment that nobody even knew what this was to make their life easier. So that's why I say, why is there no pioneers, true pioneers as judges for the Olympics? That's not, that's not right. And, and it can't just be, and it can't just be about windmills. It's about the whole art of break dancing. Dancing, not just break your neck. Mm -hmm. There's an art to this. It's not just flooring. It's not flooring. So now, you know, don't, don't make our, you know, going up and down, locking and popping, breaking and spinning into just one thing. No. Dude, we used to kill ourselves, you know, just to to do something new. Right. For you guys to endure, to enjoy, to even go out there. And, but, but why is it so easy for us to do it? Why? Because it took us to teach that one who taught that one, who taught that one to make your life easier. We learned that. And we're not getting nothing out of it. Not even a judge in the Olympics. I don't care if it's Chino. I don't care. You know, give me somebody who's level-headed because you know what? There's a lot of us that I've seen. An old head, an old pioneer. An old pioneer who are not in their level mind like they used to be. And sometimes it depresses me to see them like that. Mm -hmm. That why you should have been better than that. But there's uh, some of them that I still see that has wisdom. Mm -hmm. You know, that has knowledge, but still play with full deck. That, you know, they should be judges. Well, that's all right. That's between them. One thing I do know is that's the reason why I made this group page. Tell us about your group page. What's it called? The name of my group page is called the Art of Break Dancing B-Boy World. Facebook. Facebook. Not Instagram, because I don't like it. Not YouTube, whatever. Why Facebook? Facebook is more direct in dealing with the real people. To get, you see, YouTube is entertainment. Instagram is just for self. Facebook is for everybody. You know, and they should never, you know, it's not only about family, but also by family because your friends are your family mm -hmm. and everybody you grew up with is your family. And that's the point that when they, when they created Facebook, it was one of the greatest inventions, you know, without the negativity in it, because it gave us the opportunity to actually re-meet our friends again that we didn't see for 20 years, 15 years. So the minute that came in, that's when everybody came back. Boom. And I remember, and because of that, I left it like that. One of my friends went and told me the other day, yo, man, you know how many people are following you? I'm like, I don't know. He said 350,000 people. Wow. I said 350,000 people is following me, and I didn't even know. He told me, he goes, yeah. That's why Facebook. See what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure, for sure. In your crew, did you ever have any DJs? Yeah. You know, talk to me about them and, and their part in the crew. Our DJ was the same guy who gave us a twice as nice name, Todd Terry. And my cousin, Ruben, but he was the real DJ. Right? He used to throw these beach parties. 
And um, his part was um, to be the DJ for our breakdancing crew, and he brought, make the mixes. So when we go out there and battle, you know, we already have music with it from the big radios and all that stuff. Nice. So we used to, we used to all have big radios, double double big radio. Matter of fact, we made one that you know, a big S square box, speakers, car batteries, all kinds of you know, right. equalizers and stuff like that. And but he used to make the music. We used to put his tape in. Bah, boom, boom, boom. You know. That's when they made the rules and the bulwark, no more radios on the bulwark. Because we used to blow it up. But that was our DJ. And um, just like he inspired us, we inspired him. Because if we didn't dance to his music, then he knew there was a problem. So we fell off each other. Mm-hmm. And Todd, um, Todd, um, you know, like was a big brother to me, especially, you know? And um, not only that, he also liked it my, um, like, you know, like an artist. You know, how can you just say, voila, without a critic? Right. Because that'd be selfish, that'd be arrogant. So he used to always call me and Juan just to listen to his stuff. And that's when he started making music, real music. And um, we used to always be there when um, Love Letter came out. You know, um, I write to you, Love Letter. You know, giggles. Then you had who else? You had um, the girls. I, uh, you know, can't remember that jam. What is it? But anyway, they were called the Le girls. Then Some there freestyle was, music. Yeah, they were all freestyle, or house, you could say, whatever. Yeah. Then um, he also was a, a mixer. I taught Tar how to do beatbox. You know, like well, that came from Bushwick. That poof, poof, not came from it, but that's where I heard it from. Right, the right. Bouncing. Boom, 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 doo, 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 boom, 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 you know, easy. Right. But he didn't have that. Yeah, 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 that's what I, that's why he really liked me because of that, because I told him. But because of that, that's how he learned how to make music and put music together. So I can hear him now with the earphone mixing. You know, now it's mm-hmm. playing by itself, but he's making the sound effects. And that's how he created, um, House music to the Batmobile, let's go. Nah, nah, nah. You know, he created that. He came with all his little mix. Oh, what you think? Play it, play it. Oh, we love it. And sure enough, millions of people love it to this day. Sweet, sweet. Uh, how about any MCs? You had any MCs in the crew that. We had MCs like my cousin was an MC. Ruben was not the greatest MC, but um, who else? We got a kid right now. His name is called Mike Swift. He's running around in um in Philippines. You okay. Know, all all a spinoff from Todd and my cousin Ruben. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he got millions and millions of people, you know, who follow him. That's Mike Swift. He came from Brighton Beach. He was a Filipino. Like you said, it's not only about Puerto Ricans and black. It was about, you know, the thing about America. Because America is a melting pot. And you don't sit down and judge people by their book or their color. You judge them by their actions, right? So we had Italians in our crews. We had Russians in our crews. We had Philippines in our crew. Brighton Beach is the, it's the, it, 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 the land of, you could say, the melting pot of America, Brighton Beach, during that time. Every nationality in the world used to live in Brighton Beach. So if you go to a Bushwick, it's only black, black Puerto Rican. You, know, you go to Kona, black Puerto Rican. You go to Brown, black Puerto Rican. But you went to Brighton Beach, it was the world. The world. I promise you. I even speak Russian. You know? Why? Because, you know, and, you know, they had the old world there. So, yeah, so, um, spin off my cousin Christian, you know, they, they spin off, um, um, Nems from Coney Island. He's a spin off from, from, from them, you know, um, because they used to all hang out together in Brighton Beach. And Tara was already out there making music. Spin off who else came from our crew was, um, Coral. Coro was the cousin of that kid Johnny that I told you about that I had to whip his ass when he's this my pinstripe suit, which he became one of my best friends. And I found out he was born exactly the same day, same time as me. So he became my twin brother. He introduced me to Coro. Coro didn't even have his name yet. You know what I'm saying? And he came in and um hey, look, my cousin, it's a singer, you know? Like really, I said, Who you sing for? I'm like, oh, I did a couple of songs with Johnny O or something like that. I really okay. Well, let me hear your music. And he played it. And I was like, wow, I think I got somebody for you. 
and I introduced him to Tartari, our DJ, who made his music and made him the famous person he is right now. And that's one of our singers, one of our, you know, not only rappers, but, you know, singers too. You know, we get it twisted. Remember, like I said, we had giggles. We had uh, really, a lot of people that came off. Even Angie Martinez used to hang with us. She used to go out with two of my boys because she used to go to school at Keithborough Community College. She was the, a radio host there. She used to go with my boy J-Rock and she was my man Newly. Well, both B-Boy breakdancers in our crew. So a whole bunch of breakdowns, you know, forgot about that, but yeah. Vice Prez was Fury. Um, our, our, you could say our bookie, our accountants was Popple. And then we had people like you, Lee. We had um, L Rock. A lot of them was L Rock, Air Rock, you know, um, J Rock. We had um, Little A Rock. Then we had um, other names like Plex, Flex, you know. Oh, but we had Suicide with us. Uh, Powerful was with us for a minute before he went to us with Koreana for a minute. Um, there were so many of us, I can't remember them. And I was so young and I was always so focused on myself and trying to mash and trying to keep this crew together, you know? Did you have a manager? No, no. I am. We was the managers. And the rules were nobody was allowed to fall. <laughs> nobody was allowed to fall in love. Nobody was uh, allowed to um, smoke or take drugs or do anything negative. It was all about strictly learning how to break dance, and that's it. And respecting the crew, respecting each other. That's still to this day a lot of people, even in Korea, you know. But when they see us together, 50s, 60s, and there's so many of us, and they're just like, wow, these guys are all still together? Why? Because that's what I, I wanted to show them. No matter, even though we fought each other, but, but it was about us. It was about the family, and it was about always sticking together, but never going against each other in any manner. Right. Because why I say this, because um, during this time, you know, now when I go back to Bushwick, if there's five of us out of 50 of us that are still alive, we're lucky. They all got killed because they, they made a gang out there in that block. And they all got killed. They were big time drug dealers. Some say that that's where the free base came from. You know, there was this cat called Eddie, which was Butchie's brother. Maybe that's the reason why they killed him. They shot him 50 times. But whatever it was, that, there was a gang there. You know, so if you're from that block, you have to join it. And they were big time drug dealers. Oh, they were making mad money. Well, one of them got killed. Maybe five of them, maybe five or six of them, the ones who are telling the stories of what happened to the rest of them. Yeah. The, the B-boy life isn't as rosy as... Uh... No, no matter what, breakdancing is a beautiful art form, but it came from a bunch of roughnecks. Okay? It wasn't that it just came from somebody who just jumped out the window with roses. I promise you that was the problem. That's why breakdancing is so hard. There was a reason for that. It wasn't because, you know, people think, oh, man, you know, B-boy, nah, what a, no, it wasn't, you know, they had a choice between being in gangs or being, being you know, breakdancing and stuff like that. But why are people from gangs started joining the breakdancing? Why, why did they do it? Because it was still hard. It wasn't easy. They like punishment. Some people like to get punched in the face. That's why they got UFC. Some people like to throw themselves on the floor and bust their back and walk around with a cane for a week, you know. <laughs> But it's, it's about the punishment, you know. That's 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 where this break dancing and all this stuff came from. And even the rapping, you know, there was times where, you know, the, the rapping. What was the rapping? Here's the beginning of the rapping. Huh? Go to school. Don't learn, learn, learn. Oh, what is it? Go to school and just learn, learn, learn. Because right. a good education is what you want. What you going to do? Why are they rapping like that during those times? It was because all positive. Because it was hard. Yeah. They were trying to take it. So the music and the dancing is together. Now they're burning it again. You know what I'm trying to say? They're burning, you know, certain, you know, look at the the raw rapping nowadays, you know? They don't just kill your mother and your brother. I don't care about nobody else. You know, when, when rapping started, just go to school and learn, learn, learn. So it's getting back negative. Right, right. 2024. Now, were you ever in a, well, if, were you ever, you or your crew in, in any movies or videos? No. Like I said, uh, um, I was in uh, the Buffalo Girls okay. with, with Magnificent Force at an early age. I remember going into a park and I was hanging out. I think it was Freeze or somebody, and I was hanging out. And you know, like I said, I was so young. I, I used to, like it's like a magnet. 
you know, like even still to this day, you know, like, boom, I, I always fall in the right place with somebody that's almost doing what I'm doing, son. You know, I, I don't know how God does this, but mm -hmm. that's the way. That's why I'm here right now. See, the way God puts it, there's a change. Right? Everything is time, though. Started hanging out with, like, like I told you, with Icy Ice and stuff like that. So one day we met up in um, Lower East Side. And um, I remember that they took me to a park. And there was a whole bunch of graffiti on it. And then they were making me hold somebody, do see do your part. I don't know what was going on. But remember, I used to go to, um, I used to act like that in school. Mm -hmm. you know, I used to be in the dance class. I was already used to holding girls and doing things. So, you know, so they liked it. And they put me in there. And I broke dance a little bit. And that was it. I never knew I was in there. Until one day I looked at the video and I said, hey, wait a minute, I know that jacket that I'm wearing. And that's and I seen the, my, my boy doing the pop and knocking because that's where I learned it from. And, you know, and I, like I said, I rubbed off a lot of people too, you know. Everybody learned from somebody else. So anybody that says, I created this, no, 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 no. Before you created that, somebody else was already doing it. You must have saw it from somebody, somewhere else. I don't care if it was from a Japanese guy, Chinese guy who was doing a front flip and decided to do a suicide. That's where you learn suicide from. You must have saw it from somewhere else. That's just not coming from anywhere. Everybody learns something from somebody. And then that's why I made that video, 125 years of breakdancing. There was a reason for that. Because who knows how long breakdancing has been around that nobody even knew what the hell that was. How many people... The Egyptian, all that stuff, you know, that were dancing like that thousands of years ago. Yeah. Oh, so you invented Egyptian, you invented all that? No, no, you didn't. Oh, so you was the first one to ever do a Hespin? No, you didn't. Because I can show you footages in 1935, little kids doing Hespins already. I can show you footages of people already doing B-boy freezes in the 1800s. That's why I did that video. A lot of people was angry about that. Oh, now you just make it seem like, no, 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 it's, it's strictly entertainment. They didn't even know what they were doing. But what I am trying to say is that it took 125 years of whatever for the children of New York City to make it the art form it is today. Wow. wow. Let's talk about clubs. Was there a club that twice as nice frequented that you can say that's... You can find us here every Friday. Uh, Fun House was the club that we used to be during the time when Jelly Bean was running around, when Madonna was running around. I remember we used to run that joint. Also, the kids from, they used to call themselves the Bay Rose, which, remember, don't get it twisted. Even during the time of break dancing, there was also kick dancing. Okay, tell it, us, what's, what's that? Kick dancing is a... The way, sort of the way the Russians dance. You ever seen the Russians that they throw themselves mm -hmm. and they kick the legs, blah, 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 then they start spinning with their legs? It was a kick dance. It was a white boy. They used to wear the, the Guido shirts, you know, half shirts, tight white jeans that, you know, they look like they got a cross between their legs with their skippy, you know, and that was the way they used to dress, you know, Kujin, as you call them, the white boys, you know what I'm saying? And they used to do kick dance, and that was their shit, kick dance. So, um, which, you know, was kind of cool too. Don't get it twisted. But it was also a form of breakdancing because there's other breakdancers out there who, who was well known because they mastered the, the kick dancing and made it look like breakdancing too. So yeah, yeah, during that era, so yeah, there used to be these white boys that used to love to hang out in the fun house too. And they used to like to take the balcony in the top. And every time they used to see us, they used to get off. You know, this time we had to crack them a few times, you know, but even with that, we always used to still hang out. So fun house was one. And our, and our skating ring was Roller Palace in Brighton Beach, Sheepshed Bay. They had a big skating ring, which also the Bay Rolls used to hang in there too. So, you know, and it was called Roller Palace. Well, that's where we battle, um, let's say, um, Nasty Wood Rock. Okay. We have all these other crews from all over the neighborhoods. They used to come from everywhere just to battle us. And, um, yeah. so that's why I say we battled so many people, we didn't know who the hell we battled. All we knew is that we ain't, we ain't gonna front. Right, right. And don't start nothing and they won't be nothing. I promise you, because ain't nobody running. So that's the way my boys was because remember, before we was in breakers, we was already breaking heads. So, you know, not to sound negative about it, but you know, that's that's what I mean. It's a break dancing didn't just come from a bunch of guys who was running around with roses. If it wasn't, and it's true, they all say the same. Listen to everybody. We had it rough. And everybody who used to break dance, it was rough. You see this little cute kid, you know, very flexible, spinning around. About to be born. No, man. Don't play that 20 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. I mean, I give them respect. 
because they are a protege of what we created. You know, A-Rock, uh, before we started the video, you, you went into a little bit of poetry. Do, yeah. do you mind? I don't mind. You know? Yeah, hit us with a little bit of that poetry you had. I got, you know, that one I, you know, well known, maybe not so well known, but I can give it to you again. All right, please. I mean, I got two of them. Right? Throw one, both of you. One, 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 for, one for the, for the hip-hop world and one for my, my, my people's world. You got it. All right, so the first one is, you know, I'm going to call it late 70s, early 80s, right? Poetry, right? So I'm going to start it off. You really want to hear it? Let's go. go. All right. Late 70s, early 80s, OGs and gang law still ran the way. Here to be. Move your feet. Time for new days. What to say, Mr. DJ? To all my peeps. Big up, Mr. MC. Cops coming. Me and the boys starts to run it. Back alley. Trip over a bunk who tells us chill. There's new rides to drill. Up rocking. Body locking. House party. New rapping. Spin on the back is what? Break dancing. Urban fashion. Hairstyling. Fade away. Trash talking. Brothers hawking. Money making. Cash taking. Lay lows out of control. Guns blasting. Other days to count your blessings. Bodies flowing. Planes falling. Keep boarding. Gas sucks. Our luck. Not cracking, yet lacking, stay pimping. And with all that, where I'm at, my spacing, YouTubing, and all the tweeters on Facebook. So that's that one. Sweet. Nice. Why I say that one? Because that one is sort of telling my life in a poetry. So I'm putting all these words in one 50 years of my life just in that poetry. So if you really listen to it, there's a reason why I say it like that. But I'm putting the way I seen it the way I felt, you know, from the beginning, late 70s, early 80s, OGs and gang laws ran the way. Hear the beat. That's when the music started coming out. DJ Hurts, you know, move your feet. That's when the up rock started coming out. It's time for new days. What you say with the first DJs, you know? All right. Just listen to the, listen to the poetry. This is, you know, I can say it better. I ain't done sang it. I ain't done sang it, so. Right. So it's, it's pretty good. The other one is about my neighborhood, right? So, and even for everybody, right? So you want to hear that one? All right, here it goes. Who are we? We are the people from the edge of the sea, where the ocean, sands, and boardwalk stands with time, and so do we. We are people with big dreams that stares at the stars at night, people who sleep awake with the mist hovering over the sea, smelling the salt in the air, hearing the waves crash into the banks, People who see the days different with wonders and excitement and goals to be fulfilled. We are blessed to see such beauty. We are people that never give up and people who will never forget we are who we are. So never give up on dreams that may come true one day because the truth is who you are within yourself and with everyone else. We are people of dreams who sleep while awake. We are who we are. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Can you, uh, I appreciate that a lot. The Olympics, Paris Summer Olympics 2024. Give me your give me your take on that. What does that mean to you as a b-boy? What's your impression? What's your outlook? All right. This is something that was way overdue. This is something that should have been done in 1982, 1983, 84. This should have been in the Olympics already. I we was all preparing for that but nobody else was. But we always smelt that it was coming. Our energy from those early times, you know, at the end of the rainbow, we all wanted a prize. We all wanted trophies. Nobody never looked at that. All they want to think about, it, about themselves. Just like they made these b-boy movies and stuff like that. Just like when we went to the, um, to the break dance you know, the, the big breakdance contest, you know, I mean, sure, you know, they showed my face in, in, in television, they, but, you know, there was nothing else after that, you know, trying to say, and, the, and it was already rigged for other people, and it was because of the other people, because maybe who was better than them, but the reason why they were going in this, because it's about money, and it's about the agents, and somebody who knew somebody, and that's the reason why they, they just made it seem like that. Okay, but that was that one, but, but it didn't go no further after that. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's we we all stopped breakdancing all of us 
I don't care who it is, before the 90s. Because there was no more interest. There was no reason. I guess they never made it to the Olympics. But those who kept going and those that sprang it, sprang it back up, you know, I thanked them. You know, but um, but yeah, they sold us out. And don't get it twisted because all of us in our heart, we are all b-boys and we all have this. And we all know how to make it. We all know how to put it together. We know what's the reason, what's this, what's that. So some of us are happy, some of us are angry. Because, you know, it's long overdue, way overdue, you know. But um, what I don't like about it is that, um, like I say, um, there's no pioneers who are judges, true pioneers, where people can say, look at this beautiful move that I, that these guys, are, that's a 10. They did it perfect. Who's to say that that's perfect when they wasn't the ones who made it perfect? They saw it. They don't know what perfect is. You know, like, oh, wow, he did stuff, but that's not perfect because where's the dance? I'm with the Olympics. Thank you. Way overdue. Now, it, it makes us want to get back into this world, you know, harder than ever because now we're saying, hey, hey, something is being taken away from us. We need to catch up and, and let the world know this belongs to us. Though it took years and centuries or whatever, but it also took the children of New York City in the greatest melting pot of the world to make the greatest dance art that's finally in the Olympics, what we knew it should have been there since 1983. Way overdue. Now they made us get old so they can take it and make us die off so they can take it and make it seem new as them. 100 years later, think Cha cha ching ching for putting this in the Olympics when it should have been Chino, when it should have been Crazy Legs, Speed. They're the ones who they should be thanking. I even thank them because they showed me a better way, you know? <laughs> and, you know, for a kid that was grew up by themselves, you know, hard life. Well, thank you. Yeah, I say thank you to all of them. That's why I always call them all my big brothers. And just like I said, I made this group page called The Art of Breakdancing. And it wasn't for me. It wasn't about my crew or your crew. It's about, I call it the group page of pioneers, where everybody can settle down and become friends. Because while we're over here still bickering about something about 40 years ago, mm -hmm. you got other guys from France taking our you know, legacy away. And we're not doing nothing about it. And we're still bickering. So by me forming this, uh, yeah, I got like about 10 administrators in there and each one of them is from a different crew or a leader from another crew. I got Dynamics, Rocksteady in there, Magnificent Force. I got all of them. I got even Ralph. I even got Al, uh, Al Boogie, you know, Pioneers. And they all love it because they finally, you know, sometimes you have, you know, it's not about the Bronx, it was about Brooklyn, it's about all of us. Because if not for you, how can this one, if not for him, how can he have learned something? It, it's like a, having a puzzle without a few piece, pieces missing. No, that, that don't mean nothing. What you mean don't mean nothing? So that means the puzzle will never be complete. So let's just go from the beginning and let's put the puzzles together. And it's like that. So don't say that, oh, it came from here. Or, it couldn't have came from there. No, no, no. There's a puzzle. Figure it out. I know it. As much as I know, it's because I grew up in the streets. See, the, the streets told me the stories, the truth, not what somebody says. Because I knew, I already knew. I seen it in my face, you know, I was already doing it. But yeah, I mean, two different types of art that emerged, three different types of art that emerged, and I do all three of them. Ain't too many break dances that can pop. Ain't too many people who can up rock that can pop. Ain't too many poppers out there that can break. Or up rock. I do all three of them. Because I was ready for everybody. Anybody. And I used to burn them all. Up rocking, body locking, house party, new rapping, spin on the back. It's a rock. What does being a b-boy mean? It's uh, 
you can say thank you. Being a B-boy is an honor that, you know, something that we created from the streets, that from nothing, something to something, nothing for something, you know, and, um, you know, it was an honor that we're here. Because if not for B-boying, I'm going to say 70% of these people that you see now that you're talking to, they won't be here. So it's an honor to be a break dancer. It's an honor that, you know, that we wasn't only a professional fighters and killers. And just, we was dancers. We was artists. We was with people with dreams, you know, still to this day. Age is catching up to all of us. So... You know, like I said, that's why I put this together. So it gives us a chance to try to catch up. And let's say, okay, well, if it's age that's taken us, but then with age come wisdom. So now if the if this is something that we created, then we need to take it back because we're grown men now. We're not little kids running on a damn cardboard no more. Those days are over. The loaning is over. Now it's, we can't, I know you want to do a head spin. I know you want to do a back spin, but we can't do it. Our mind says, yeah, but our body says, no. It ain't gonna happen, Papa. You're not going down there no more. Uh, what I told you, now you gotta wear ace bandages and have bang gay all day for the next week or so. <laughs> so, you know, but it's an honor because we still do it. You know what I'm trying to say? It's an honor for us to see these little kids who are, yeah, going to the Olympics, or who are, yeah, still doing it. And, you know, like, I, you know, we like that, but it's an, you know, it's an honor truly you know, to say thank you because of, you know, of whatever God put at that moment of time, because I don't care what anybody says. There's a reason for everything. And there's a time limit for anything. You know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. And it's not our time. It's always in God's time. So it's just like electricity. Electricity, oh, lo and behold, 500 years, America didn't have light. But all of a sudden, within about 40 years, with three different scientists that were born almost in the same time, in the same era, it was meant to be that it was going to be light in America. And there is. Same thing with breakdancing. Lo and behold, from a, something that's been around for who knows, but where they're popping, up rocking, and breakdancing come, but it's a form of the same kind of art dance that came because it was meant to be. So even if breaking when we came in, up rock would have been there. If even a break, up rock, Probably would have been there a lot, but all three of them were there. It was at that time, and also at the same time, by you know the music and all that stuff also emerged. Because how can we dance without the music? So everything was a reason for the children of the and for something that's in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. No, it's an honor, but it's not about just throwing yourself on the floor and say, yeah, 10 points. There better be music. There better be dances. There better be a, and it better be a 10 because I'll turn off the TV right away. And um, like I said, um, in this group page, I also was thinking, okay, well, we're going to have a BBA, a BBPA. What's that? What's a BBPA? Well, it's going to be called B-Boy Pioneer Association, where we also can all form and all the pioneers can get together and tell the Olympics people, well, you're not going to be able to do this unless one of those one of those pioneers are out there to, to be a judge. You're running away with our stuff. You know what I'm trying to say? It will, we don't have a say-so. So we, that's, that's the true reason also why I made this group. We can all form together. Or we can have a president who can talk for us. Who's going to be the president of BBP? A. B-Boy Pioneer Association. Think about it. A president who's going to sit down and say, okay, we vote. We're going to vote crazy legs to go out there to be the judge for the Olympics. Because he came here. Why is it a kid from Florida? I don't care. I love you, Spanish. God bless you. But why is a kid from Florida being a judge when there's kids... Puerto Rican kids from out here that should be in there automatically. At least one from New York City. But there's none, right? Is there? I don't know. I don't know either. I'm hoping to God. Why is it that Chino was speaking about breakdancing during 1982 in television and news reporters are listening to him, and yet he's not a judge? Well, he was already waving the flag for that. 
even me, because I never heard that documentary where he ever said that. But I've been saying that since 1982. This should be in the Olympics. And this is what we learned. Do you? When you got kids that can do 20 backflip, 30 backflips in the same spot on this table without, without falling, they're better than the Olympics kids. You know what's that to do? And then land on your head and do a head spin. How about that? Let me see anybody in the gymnast do that. No, we used to do that. We used to do backflip, backflip, backflip in the same spot. Catch ourselves in a handstand, go down, and just do a head spin like no. That's really hard to do. You're going against gravity, you know, balancing your so much, so much power into that. I remember when I used to hang on the train station like a flag. And we used to wait for each stop. And we used to hold ourselves like flags, challenging each other, you know. It felt like a flag, so light, so powerful. Gino was like that too. All of them was like that. Strong, strong. But they still got strong minds though, you know what I'm saying? And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, you know, we have an association where all these crews can sit in a round table and vote. Who's going to be the president of this association? I mean, I won't ever want to be it, but I won't mind somebody like you to do it. And you can actually get us together and we start a BBP association where we can have say-so, where we can say, well, we can throw events, where millions of people, can, and then we can all get a little, little money, maybe drive a nice little Mercedes for something that other people are going to be driving. There. People get famous. A guy called Poppy John, right? You ever heard of him? Bro, he got like 30 million followers. So you're still getting money off of Facebook? I mean, YouTube. 30 million, you know? Wow. I got you. You know, Joseph Anthony Salgado, also known as A-Rock, founder and president of Twice As Nice Rockers. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Peace, my brother.